Have you ever wondered if your company is maximizing the return of your data investment? Are you collecting the right data required to make informed decisions? Is there more that can be learned from our data? Coyus Institute can answer these questions and help you discover the hidden value within your data sets by utilizing a well-rounded approach to data analysis. Stop leaving value behind and start increasing the return on your data investment. The next generation of data analysis has begun. We are pioneers in pattern discovery. We are Coyus Institute. It's good to see you again. I think the last time I saw you, we were sharing a pretty turbulent flight out of California. <laughs> yeah, that was that was quite an intense time. It was just a wonder that we were sitting next to each other on the plane as well. But Strange little synchronicity that we both got matched up at the same time. And I think we were just trying to drink a couple of gin and tonics and get through that. <laughs> right. Yoshi, you told me a story um, when we were on that flight, I guess, to try and make me feel better. And I would love to. <laughs> that story again because it is a crazy turbulent flight story we were in uh, pakistan for um i believe it was for soccer during my high school time uh, i grew up in south asia i grew up in Kathmandu, nepal and our school very small international school would compete in a south asian league either in basketball or soccer sometimes we did field hockey volleyball swim team track and field and we would go to different cities uh, in different countries that would host us each year for each of these events. And so we were in Karachi, Pakistan for soccer. Actually, no, sorry, we were in Islamabad. And coming out of Islamabad, there was nobody on our flight. And so it was just the, the boys' soccer team and the girls' basketball team and our coaches. And the rest of the flight was completely empty. And this is, you know, end of May, somewhere around this time, right about when the monsoon kicks in. And the monsoon will sweep up from the coast of India across India up into Nepal. And when it hits Nepal, it gets incredibly windy. It blows over all the signboards and people's satellite dishes go flying off, off their rockers. And uh, we were on this flight and we got hit by the worst patch of turbulence I've ever been in. We were being pushed the whole way into Kathmandu Jesus. by this incredible, incredible storm. And we were dropping for minutes on end. I mean, everybody's hanging out of their seats. The seats were flopping back and forward. We're all praying, going, God, I have no time to flight. And then when we got into Kathmandu, the back wind was so hard that when we hit the runway, he came in wobbling. And it was like he hit the runway and part of the wings scraped. And he's going down the runway, barreling down it at such a high speed that Kathmandu runway isn't very long. And so he's like applying the brakes, applying the brakes. And he had to take the domestic turn off because it's, it's a little bit of a different section that comes into the airport. And he's taking that and he's screeching. We're sliding down to the end of the runway and we finally come to a complete stop. And if we had kept going, we would have been the 19th hole on the golf course. Oh my God. <laughs> it's the golf course is on the other side of the runway. So we get off the plane and I think my sister had come to pick us up and Everybody was just pale white as a ghost getting off that plane. Going, oh man, we made it. We made it. <laughs> that is a crazy story. I remember you telling me this as we were kind of bumping up and down. It made me feel a little bit better. The the, the turbulence we experienced was a walk in the park in comparison to something <laughs> like that. But uh, no, you know, it was during this flight, which again was so funny because we had been for people for context. We'd been at a conference in California, Contact to the Desert, and I'd met you a couple times prior at different conferences, but. It was when we were leaving California and I'd said my goodbyes. I, I hadn't seen you. And so you, you were at the airport or I arrived at the airport. Uh, right before. Well, it turns out we're both on the same flight. I was like, oh, that's cool. Man. We're both on the same flight. Ask cool. get our tickets. We're both on the same seats next to each other. It's like, <laughs> not right random. Now. Are you kidding me right now? So it felt like a sign from the universe that we were supposed to talk a little bit more. And, uh, you know, I started learning a lot more about you and how much knowledge you have in relation to esoteric and, and mysticism teachings within the Eastern traditions. And you had a pretty interesting childhood because your father took you around the world and you were actually, well, you pretty much grew up in Nepal, right? Yeah, correct. So a little bit, you know, my background, I, I do esoteric research. I also do occult symbol symbology research and I, I go to ancient sites and I've been all around the world couple times now, but when I was four, my dad moved my family to Kathmandu, Nepal. And I mean, you grow up there, you don't really realize the culture, the culture shock, but coming back to the States a couple of times, because I lived there off and on, uh, literally between the age of four and then when I graduated high school 
And then I went back three years later and did a, a six month internship there at a large format graphic design company. And it, it, you don't really realize it until you start moving around, you lose all your friends. And then you're in this new place and you got to meet a whole new set of friends. And then you're only there for a year and you move somewhere else. And you're like, oh man, where, where are all my friends and what's going on with this? And what was great was the, the international school in Kathmandu is so small that you kind of have this collective of friends that stay with you for your entire life. And I, I really appreciated that. I've gone back and some of the younger kids, you know, that I used to tutor when I was there in high school or now or were in high school when I went back and they're like, oh, that's fine. You know, welcome back. And I mean, it's, it's, you feel like you're part of a large family. And I, I really appreciated that. Yeah. You were raised there. So it wasn't a big deal. It was more of a big deal coming back to the Western cultures, but at the same time, you're still a technically a Westerner in this type of country. So what was your right. experience like growing up in that environment around a different set of cultures? We're, we're called third culture kids. That's, right. There's an actual tech, a name for it. Uh, yeah. And, uh, it's, it's a child that's born in one culture. Let's raise another culture and through that other culture experiences multiple cultures, basically. And so, God, early, I was there, 1980, 81 was when I moved to Nepal. And so electricity was very uh, patchy <laughs> at, at best. At times we had, you know, electricity every once in a while would go out, you know, you get out the candles and you light all the candles up and government was very interesting because you had uh, the royal family was in charge of the country, but it had a panchayat um, parliament system that right. worked with it. And so working around that was very interesting. And you, you were in, you were actually in Nepal during the people's movement revolution against the monarchy. Correct. 1990, 91. Yeah. The democracy. Indeed. I was a little intense. Um, I, I won't lie. It definitely was. So what happened was a lot of the students rebelled against the government. And so there were massive riots in the street. And at some point, you know, they were tear gassing everybody. And at another point, the army just drove in and started open firing on, you know, crowd control basically. And it quieted everything very quickly. And then Kathmandu and most of the rest of the country went into complete blackout curfew. You know, if they saw you with your lights on at night, they'd stone your house or, you know, shoot at your house. And they had, you know, wow. police and military walking up and down the street everywhere. Um, I got ushered because where we were living it was interesting. My aunt at the time was a congresswoman uh, under George Bush Sr. from Washington State, Julian Unsold. And so our house was bugged. They thought that we were, you know, releasing secrets out to the world. And so when my dad lived off post. He lived in Pokro, which is it's a good nine hour drive away from Kathmandu. But by way of the crow flies, it's only a couple hundred miles. It's just the roads are horrific and always washed out and very windy. And you're usually stuck behind a large Tata truck going about two kilometers an hour. <laughs> and so uh, my sister and I were ushered off to. Um, a friend of ours house because they were in a gated community and they had security and we didn't. And so it was interesting. Uh, my friend Tom and I would go up on the roof and, you know, try not to be seen by the military. It was literally patrolling the rural area and you couldn't get food. I mean, none of the shops were open. And then like once a week they'd allow the shops to open. And so everybody would gang rush the shops and buy chicken and, you know, vegetables and whatever they could get their hands yeah. on. It was, it was, it was hairy for a little while. And then, you know, it kind of, kind of cleared itself up, fortunately, but obviously it takes its, its traumatic toll on people. And so when did you, what, at what point, either in your childhood or as you got older, when did you start getting interested in the mystery teachings, esoteric and really digging into it as a, as a research endeavor? Well, in high school, I read Fingerprints of the Gods. I didn't really I didn't really know who Graham Hancock was at the time. I was very fascinated in the book, um, primarily because it was teaching me about the world that I had never really seen. A lot of places that I'd never been, you know, a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting sites and things. And growing up, I immersed myself deep into the Mahabharata. You know, this is the most fantastical science fiction epic you'll ever read from four hundred thousand years ago. <laughs> the the Mahabharata. Yeah, it's so it's it's. It's an Indian epic. It's it's about an 18-day war where gods who have left the planet, gods, small g, uh, left the planet during a huge solar cataclysm, and they went to what they called the fourth dimensional realm from the sun, which is Mahar, okay? Or, or there, there's another, 
extension on Mahar. I'm not thinking of it right now. And they stayed there for a thousand or two thousand years. And while they were there, they figured they would come back to Earth and repopulate Earth. And so here they are, gods, you know, these what we would call gods because they have all this amazing technology. And they've grown a bit in stature. Their skin color has changed to like pale colors of blue and green and, and white. Their eyes have gone blue or green. Their hair has gone auburn. And they come back to Earth thinking, oh, we're just going to repopulate Earth. And so they're flying back in these what they call flying palaces or vimanas. And they come back to Earth and realize that the children of Earth have survived the cataclysm and are thriving. And so all of a sudden there's this war between the gods and the demigods called the Mahabharata, which is the war for the land. And it took, takes place over 18 days. And the stuff that is described in this story, you know, is more fantastical than Star Wars or Buck Rogers or any of these, you know, movies and, and clicks that we grew up around. Because here you have these people flying around in these flying palaces or even smaller craft called Vimanas. Um, they're using laser guided weaponry. <laughs> just describe Wait, what, what do you mean what do you mean like, using laser guided weaponry well like like um smart smart technology wep weaponry when well, you yeah, fire how's that how's that described in the, in the text they're described as arrow you know like krishna's great arrow or stuff like this but right, what right. the arrow does is you know it, it's a hunter seeker it will it will track things and you know this is this is laser guided technology in a sense without really it being explained as such uh, they talk about artificial intelligences and robots that they have created to help fight the war. Right, like, like, like the automatons. Yeah, like correct. And, th and then they also use this this devastating weapon, which is described like, you know, an atomic bomb going off or a nuclear weapon called the Barastra. And when it goes off, it destroys everything in its path. It burns the flesh off of elephants running away. You know, it, it decimates the land. It leaves it completely unlivable. It kills crops. And it's, I mean, they're describing... A you know, it's an epic poem. They're describing, you know, technologies that have never been invented. It's, it's just, it's mind boggling to be, to have read that. And so I, I was immersed in that. My, um, we had a, a maid that worked for the house and we helped her sons through school. And so her younger son, Ram, Ram and I would always go in, read the comic books and, and get into the Mahabharata. And so that kind of was where it started, but it didn't really click for me until after I got back from my thesis in Bhutan in 98, I got into a car accident and I had a lot of downtime. I got hit on, on I got hit on my bike by a car. I, I basically totaled myself and the car with my body of the bike. And I had a lot of downtime and I started diving into a lot of esoteric knowledge at that point. It just started clicking. And I was very interested in what, you know, what's, what's, what is the world, you know, cause we're, we're told one story. But then we have this other story from all these ancient times that just don't make sense. Mm. So the story of ancient Egypt, it's like, okay, what is, what's going on here? Uh, the story around Peru and a lot of, you know, what was happening with the Inca, my, my history professor lived in Peru. And so he kind of sparked that whole idea about the Inca. And then just even living in Nepal, Nepal has its own ancient culture. I mean, it's the size of California. There's 42 different, um, tribal or, or sociological groups, and they all have their own languages spread out in this little tiny country that's, that goes literally from almost sea level to the world's highest mountains. And then right next door to it on one side is Tibet, which has its old, you know, its own ancient culture. You have Bhutan, which is kind of near, there's a little bit of India between uh, Bhutan and Nepal, but Bhutan has probably the oldest remaining uh, Buddhist monasteries and artwork. Mm -hmm. And then you have all these ancient sites in India. Um, and it's just amazing to go see these places and then, you know, start wondering about how, how and when they were built. And so that was pretty much my introduction to the esoteric knowledges. And then I just kept diving in deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. As is the tendency. Once you grab on a thread of something like this, I, I understand the drive to, to learn more and this for you has now culminated into a book that you've written. It's called Dropa, Legends and Law, Connecting the Ancient Secrets of Bhutan, China, Nepal, Tibet, and Sirius. And that's an interesting thing because that's reflected in the UFO research field, a lot of reference to Sirius. So what inspired you to write this book? What are you trying to tell people with this book? Well, the book is kind of a culmination of different parts of research in my life. And um, it started with, 
as I was saying, in 98, I went back to Nepal for a graphic design internship. And while I was there, my father was working in Bhutan. And I was waiting for a special access permit to go spend two months and do my thesis study in Bhutan. I wanted to study uh, Buddhist artwork, Buddhist illustration, because my background was illustration and graphic design, um, art and architecture around Buddhist cultural mysticism, because there's a lot of sorcery, magic, and shamanism that happens in Buddhism, as well as, you know, this beautiful philosophy. Mm. And so getting into Bhutan is really difficult. Uh, at that time, they were only allowing about 2,000 tourists a year, and your visa would be 300 to $600 a day, not including transportation, food, hotels, or any of that. And you're only allowed 10 days at most. And so, and you're only allowed to go halfway through the country from Paro to Bumtong, which is like, it's an 11 hour drive and everything's <laughs> right. up down and very windy. And you're not allowed to see a lot because they don't, they, they have a very structured tourist program for you. And for me, I wanted to go see all these Lakongs and Zongs, yeah. which are the name of their monasteries. So I could see some of this ancient, you know, wall art and old Tonkas that I've never seen the light of day for Westerners, basically. And so while I was there, I started getting into different aspects of, of the Buddhist cultural mysticism that led me towards Sirius. And so in Buddhism, they talk about Mount Meru. Mount Meru is a very physical place. It exists in, in Tibet, but it's also considered a dimensional portal. And so it stems from the root chakra in the earth, the sacred city of Shambhala, um, or, um, Agartha or, or however, you know, whatever you want to call it, Shangri-La, but it's a mystical city that, that resides in the inner earth. And so this is the base chakra of the mountain. And from it are seven layers or seven multiple layers of different dimensions. And each one is inhabited by different types of beings. And so you have, you know, filth and dirt and rock and mud and then earth. And then, you know, some of the more astral uh, planes all the way to the crown chakra, which is the top of the mountain. And interestingly, in a lot of the depictions of Mount Meru, it is connected to what they call in, in Buddhism, the brightest star that rises in the East. Well, this is Sirius mm. and it's connected to Sirius by a rainbow or a rainbow bridge, which could also be indicative of, you know, the Milky way for, for instance, which stretches from the mountains all the way to the horizon middle of the night right. and without light pollution if you've ever seen the milky way it's beautiful it's, it looks like a cosmic rainbow i mean it's it does, it does yeah it's, it's interesting and so this was kind of the first idea around sirius and then from that i learned about the four gifts that came from sirius which kind of became the foundational pillars of, of, of buddhism and they supposedly arrived here according to legend around twenty thousand years ago and were brought down from the mountain. They were placed in a sacred box and they were stored in the city of Shambhala for, for safekeeping. And the four items would be the Sintamani stone, which is considered the luck wish fulfilling stone or um, dream stone for that matter. And it's a piece of meteorite that came from Sirius. And so this piece of meteorite, whoever possesses it is granted longevity of life, kind of like the philosopher's stone in a sense. And, and good prosperity, you know, good fortune and, and good luck, basically. And then there's the four-sided uh, Vajra Dorje, which uh, Dorje is a lightning bolt. And so the four-sided lightning bolt is very particular because it, it deals with the four winds or the four elements or even the four cardinal directions that make up the foundations of Vajrayana Buddhism. Then you have the singing bowl or Buddha's bowl. And so when you strum this and, and, and uh, resonate it, it creates a oscillation or a harmonic oscillation that attunes the body and the mind to, to start uh, going into a state of enlightenment or, or nirvana. And then the fourth item in the box is this disc or this circular plate called the Om Mani Stone. And on it is listed Om Mani Padme Hum, which is a mantra that monks will speak when they go into these um, transitional states. So those are the four items that came from Sirius. <laughs> and then I started learning there's Wait, a room. Where is it where is it written, by the way? Just like where where is it written in what text that these four items come from Sirius? That I'd have to have to look into a little deeper. Yeah. But this this was coming from a lot of the wall art in in the monasteries. And so my translator would be explaining to me what was what. 
And in one of the wall arts, there's this depiction of a procession for the first, what, what is he called? He's called the Druk Galpo or dragon, cloud dragon king. Druk or Drok means cloud dragon yeah. uh, in, in the Bhutanese um, language. And so he's the first cloud dragon king. Uh, his name is Jurgen Wanchu or Deb Nog Po, which is his, his Drokpa name. And in the procession leading up to him is this little three and a half foot, four foot tall depiction of a dropa or a drokpa, which are these nomadic people that come out of far eastern Tibet. And in his hand is the singing bowl and the Sintamani stone. And so I, I started asking about what, what are these elements? And this is where I get this story of, oh, these four gifts came from Sirius or from the brightest star that rises in the east. And so part of Buddhism that's practiced in Bhutan is Nyingmapa. Nyingmapa is very, very, very much full of sorcery and magic. And there's, you know, shamanistic practices. And they talk a lot about these ascended tolku masters. And so Siddhartha would be considered an ascended tolku master or Sakyamuni, however you want to call him. And Milarepa would also be considered an ascended tolku master. An ascended tolku master is somebody that in their own lifetime has achieved the state of being a bodhisattva or somebody that's achieved the state of enlightenment, but out of compassion has stayed behind to help others through their own suffering. They've also completed, you know, the prowess of mind, body, and spirit and have mastered what they call meditational spiritual technology of astral projecting your, your consciousness or your physical form protected by Merkaba energy through the dimensions of time and space to different realms, planets, suns, even galaxies. And so three of these guys, I call them the ascended, ma ascended Toku masters of Sirius, because in the stories around them, they have astral projected themselves to Sirius and back. This, this is something that really interests me because I think, and I've, I've said it a number of times that I think that there are these lost technologies from times far gone that we don't really understand through our technological paradigm. Right. But would probably echo what someone like Nikola Tesla says about frequency and resonance and vibration and tone and geometry, and that there are ways to achieve things that we think can only be achieved technologically through wires and cables and pistons and that bolts. Yeah that there is another method that we have lost that taps into innate abilities within the human being, our ability to change the frequency of our output through our brain waves and to channel resonance and sound. And so this to me does speak of a potential long lost technology, technology right. of spirit, technology of, uh, of self. And it's mastered through complete repetition and repetition and, you know, mastery. And this is, this is why it's considered a technology. Like you said, we, we're all considered about these widgets that we, you know, have all in our daily lives, but there are, I mean, fire could be considered a spiritual technology in a sense. And so there are different, there are different aspects there. And, um, yeah, these, these three masters are, are, are a fascinating bunch because, <laughs> One of them is depicted, you know, in meditation, flying off the top of, of Mount Meru on a rainbow toward the east into the clouds. And so <laughs> I, I could get into these these three uh, these three guys if, if you'd like. But um, who are the Dropa people and what are the Dropa? So it's a multifaceted conversation piece because it comes out of reality and it comes out of stories and it comes out of a time period as well. And so, according to legend, um, the Dropa arrived here about 12,000 years ago from Sirius after Sirius had gone through a cosmic war. And so, the cosmic war was ended by one of the planets being bombarded by atomic technology and, and laid to waste. Laid, laid to waste. It was left as mud, rocks, mountains, and filth. And the surviving civilizations banded together decided, you know, just obviously they're a type two civilization because they have the ability to, to travel between stars. And so they started building these large generation ships or, or arcs basically to go to other planetary systems to see if they're inhabitable and then could be colonized. And so about 12,000 years ago, they show up here and then start realizing earth is very similar to the planetary systems that they came from. 
and realize that they need to collect mineral, plant, animal life, you know, uh, samples, basically water, air, and bring them back to Sirius for testing. Obviously, it takes a couple of generations to get there and back. Is this is this written in in historical text? This is not. This is this comes out of a book. <laughs> the book is called Sun Gods in Exile, and uh, it's 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 a very fascinating book because a lot of people who well, not so many people have read it because there aren't a lot of in publication, but of the people who have read it, they're very skeptical of it because there are cultural aspects that are described in this book that right. nobody would have known of when the book was written. And so the skeptics are like, oh, that's that's something that a human being could not do. Well, of course they can, and they do quite quite literally today. <laughs> or, you know, this this is a cultural aspect that just doesn't exist. Well, it would exist if you had immersed yourself in Tibetan or especially Bhutanese culture. And then, you know, the 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 third reality around the book is, oh, in, in 98, the author allegedly came out to forty and times and said, Oh, I hoaxed this whole book in a tell all interview or article in the book in the magazine. And so I started diving deep into the stories behind the Dropa. And uh, there's a story that comes out. Basically, there was a documentary series that came out in 2004 that introduced me to the lore and legend of the Dropa. And it stars um, UFO researcher Richard Dolan, David Serrata, and Hartwig Hausdorff, who wrote the Chinese Roswell. And so they tell of this story that comes out of three magazines in the 1960s, particularly 1962. Um, the first is called Vegetarian Universe, which comes out of Germany. The second publication was called the UFO Bulletin from Belgium. And the third is very popular magazine at this time, Sputnik Magazine out of the Soviet Union. And so, and then again in 1968, supposedly it was written in the pages of Eric Van Daniken's Chariots of the Gods. And so it tells the story that in 1938, a cultural archaeologist named Chipute and his team are exploring caves in a very remote region of what then would have been considered Eastern Kham Tibet, but now is considered Central China because obviously the, the invasion. And it's this area called Bayan Karaula and Bayan Harshan, and it's it's where the headwaters of the Yangtze and uh, Yulong rivers are, and it's notorious for caves. And in many of these caves have been found ancient petroglyphs, um, mummified bodies like the Tara mummies, um, manuscripts, and cultural artifacts. And in one of the caves, they discover that the wall, ceiling, and floor have been hewn out of the bedrock using a technique or technology that's unfamiliar to these archaeologists in 1938. And the cave walls could, could be considered similar to a place in um, Peru called Napa Iglesia, which is way up in the mountains in the Sacred Valley, and it's literally a cave that has one of its walls sheen cut, 90 degree angles, and there's a false uh, door that that sits back three different levels inside of it. And you're in the middle, you're in the middle of nowhere, and you've got to beg the question: Who's cutting this? And how? You know, there's no way you can get electricity or a generator up here, and there's no way that you can get one one thousandth of an inch tolerance on these walls, and so. <laughs> There's other caves around the world very similar, like the Barbara Caves in India. But in particular, this caving group they found in the Bayan Karaula, a very remote region. On one of the walls are petroglyphs of the sun, the moon, the um, star system of Canis Major and Sirius, and then a dotted line coming from Sirius to the mountains. In the back of the cave, they find the remains of row upon row of skeletal and mummified bodies. Uh, they're all about three foot five to four foot or a little over a meter, meter tall. They have elongated skulls slightly. Um, the mummified bodies have this orangish colored skin, you know, and what the, the remains of blue eyes, basically, which is incredibly rare for anybody in this region of, of Asia because Tibetans do not have blue eyes, Chinese do not have blue eyes, Nepalese do not have blue eyes. You know, this, this is not a trait that's, that's very well known for this region. And buried with them is a disc, uh, a plate that's about a foot diameter. Um, hold on a second. <laughs> oh, cool. Is this, um, is this like a copy? Like a no. This is this is actually a Chinese bi disc, but on it um, are is a proto Chinese language. So the language on the disc itself is actually not what we would consider Chinese today. So it's a, a language that predates Chinese. 
but this is about roughly the size of the disc. And on it are two spiraling grooves coming out of the circle in the, in the center that have a very small glyphic writing that is foreign or alien to the archaeologists. Upon further excavation, they find 716 other discs, uh, but we're not told if any of these have any writing in, in any of the story. And so this is the story that came out of um, this documentary, pretty much, and has been repeated in nauseam in everybody's blog posts, documentaries, um, videos, and, and articles about the Dropa and the Dropa stones. Uh, in 1958, another professor at the... Oh, sorry. So they, they collect some of the stones and materials. They take them back to the Beijing Academy of Sciences. Uh, in 1958, so 20 years later, a professor there named Sun Un Nui cracks the code and deciphers the foreign or alien language on the disc and claims that it says that a group of extraterrestrials named the Dropa came here 12,000 years ago, crash landed, were unable to, you know, phone home or, or, or get help or repair their ship and were forced to intermingle with the Ham Chinese cultural tribe of that time so that they could survive, basically becoming a hybrid race. Wow. Um, Dolan, Sereda, and Hartwig Hausdorff kind of claim that there's a lot of interesting stuff around the story, but a lot of it could be hoaxed or fake right. because Chipute is not a Chinese name. Sun Nui is not a Chinese name. The Beijing Academy of, of Sciences and Prehistory doesn't exist. There are no people called the Dropa. You know? Where did the discs go? Um, one, at least one of the discs ends up in the Soviet Union in the early 60s. It's done, uh, mineral tests are done on it as well as oscillation testing. And so through the mineral test, they discover that it is jadeite. This is jade. So this is a red jade. But the ones that, that they had were jadeite. And jadeite is more of a granite structure uh, that has um, basically jade crystalline uh, matrix in it. But they also discovered cobalt and mercury, which is not uncommon with jadeite. And what's interesting about jade or jadeite, and granite in general, is if you put it under extreme pressure, it will create a piezoelectric effect to which the cobalt and mercury will hold like a charge, like a battery in your cell phone or your Tesla or, or whatnot, and, or even solid state hard drives. It has a very similar um, natural technology of that. And so then they throw it on an oscillation machine. They, you know, hook it up to electrodes in the doc, in the documentary, they say they threw it on some sort of record player and we're trying to play it but that's not what an oscillation machine is basically they're pumping uh, electricity through it and they realize that it has a harmonic resonance as if it's had or been around incredible amounts of electricity right. but then after this we don't really know you know what what's happened to the discs um in 1966 mao launches his cultural revolution in china so a lot of their prehistory is swept under the rug. A lot of it is destroyed, and a lot of it is either smuggled out in private collections or kept in private collections. And then none of it sees the light of day until probably the early to mid '80s, um, after after Mao's Cultural Revolution had ended in the late six uh, late '70s. What's fascinating about this story is, and you know, this is where I started diving a little bit deeper into it. Was our good friend Johnny Enoch challenged me about two and a half years ago, knowing my, my background in Nepal, knowing a little bit about my thesis and knowing that the Dropa are supposedly also coming from Sirius and ending up in Tibetan. And here we have, you know, here we have Buddhist mysticism dealing with Sirius as well. So there's this, there's this strange overlap. He kind of challenged me to, to dive into this and see as much as I could find. And I, I dove into it wanting to debunk the story just like everybody else. And realized that a lot of the research around it had been very poorly executed. It was just surface level. And I started realizing that because I started hunting down the three magazines that uh, supposedly this originated in from 1962. And out of all my research, I have not been able to find a single edition, publication, or article in any magazine called Vegetarian Universe, hmm. which makes me wonder if the magazine or, or news publication even existed. Uh, same with the Belgium UFO Bulletin. Nothing. No articles, no logos, <laughs> no publications, nothing. It's like these these two publications do not exist. And so for these to be the main source of this story was very fascinating to me. 
And so it's interesting that Sputnik magazine is very available online. Uh, you can find all their all their archives from the late fifties all the way into the seventies, like in depth, because it was a very popular magazine at, at its time and sort of still is. And so in 1962, there are no articles in any edition of Sputnik's publication about the dropout. And so then I went to 1968's Eric Von Daniken's, you know, uh, Chariots of the Gods, and there isn't a single reference of the Dropa Stones or Bayankar Ula in there either. And so I was like, what, why, you know, why is this what these researchers are telling us from this documentary from the 2005, the UFO files? Either this is bad research or deliberate misdirection or the combination of both which as you and I both know in this field is very, very possible. There's a lot of misdirection and there's a lot of bad research. <laughs> and so I kept hunting and kept hunting. And I actually came across a German publication from 1964 called UFO Nachrichten. And this directly translates to UFO news or UFO bulletin. And I started wondering, is this, is this the source or the origin of the German and Belgian UFO stories just misinterpreted into a different name or a different publication because in belgium they speak german german is is like one of the main languages in belgium and so there's there's a crossover there obviously this publication could have been printed in belgium as well and in it it tells the story of chipute it mentions that the original story came out of a publication called vegetarian universe but it doesn't cite a date publication or an edition and so the, there's a question there, and it goes through Chipute's discovery in in the village uh, or in the caves. It goes through basically uh, Simon Nui's translation of the discs and how he claims that the Dropa arrived twelve thousand years ago, so on and so forth. But in the translation from German to English, instead of the Ham Chinese, they're talking about the Kam Tibetans of the region. So. I started thinking, huh, there could be a transliteration issue going on with this story, which is why people doing research into it haven't discovered any of the information around it. And so for me, that was incredibly fascinating because I started looking a little bit deeper into the story and I found a 1967 publication from Sputnik magazine that retells almost verbatim the story that came out of the German publication. And in the German publication, Simon Nui translates what's on the disc. And there is a translation of it. There's also a translation of it in Sputnik magazine. And the translations are almost the same, but slightly different. And the translation goes like this. The Dropa came down from the clouds in their winged gliders 10 times before the sunset. The local villagers, men, women, and children hid in the caves until they realized that this time the Dropa came with peaceful intention. And so this is not the translation of an alien language, which is what some of the skeptics around this story have claimed the story is a hoax. How can you translate an alien language? I, I believe Richard Dolan and Serena both said this without a cipher. I mean, if you don't have a cipher, there's no way that you're going to be able to translate this. But if you're translating a language that's regional, that looks foreign to, you know, Chinese glyphs, you have more of a way of actually doing a translation. And the translation sounds like it's from the observation of the people who witnessed the crash or crash landing. And so I went, huh, so this would be the calm Tibetan who they ended up intermingling with. So then you jump over to the other story in Sputnik magazine. It literally tells the exact same story. It goes into the Soviet uh, connection with it as well, with all the testing. But the translation is slightly different. And in Simon Nuri's initial translation, he says that they intermingled with the Ham Chinese, not the Kam Tibetan. So you have Ham Kam, Ham Kam. This is where I started thinking transliteration might be an issue here. And then the translation is slightly different. It says... The Dropa came down from the clouds in their craft. Well, craft could either be singular or plural. In the initial story, it was winged gliders. And then the villagers hid in the caves 10 times before the sunset. 
And so it's flipped the, the 10 time aspect. And so there's obviously a difference between German syntax and Russian and French and English syntax. So that could be the way of the, of the flip, but then it says the same thing that they, they came this time with peaceful intention. And so it, it means that they've come once before. And so this to me, or, or multiple times before, who, who knows, but th there's a, a commonality that they are known amongst these village groups. And so I started applying the lens of um, transliteration for, for those listening. Transliteration is when you hear something in one language and you transcribe it into your language or another language to tell the reader or whoever is interested in the story uh, what you heard. And so the Ham, which I looked them up, there is no cultural group in China that ever has been called the Ham or the Ham. They just don't exist. There's the Han, H-A-N, but they were they were more of an imperial class that ruled China for a specific period of time. But there is in this region of Bayan Karla and Bayan Aushan, the, the Kham Tibetan. And in 1950, when the Chinese invaded Tibet, they swept through this region and they either killed, persecuted, or forced a lot of these small village groups to go into a nomadic um, situation, basically, become nomads. And this is where the legend of the Dropa comes from. Because here you have this group of people, they're all short in stature, they're all like this or orangish brown skin, most of them have blue eyes, they're all four feet tall, uh, they wear these spider caps that are felted wool and inverted leather, and they wander from far eastern Kham Tibet through Tibet into Bhutan, into northern India, Nepal, Ladakh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, and up into the Black Sea area. And along the course of this nomadic wandering, their name changes. So in far eastern Kham Tibet, it's the Dropa. In the middle of Tibet, it's called the Zopa. In Bhutan, they're called the Drokpa. And in Ladakh and up into the Black Sea area, they're called the Brokpa. And this is, this is all a transliteration of the same name. And so for those who say, oh, these people don't exist, they certainly do. And they speak a language that's older than Chinese, older than, than uh, Nepalese and, and Tibetan, and older than Sanskrit. And it's called Shinna. And it, it, it's the, the sub-dialect of Shinna is Brokskat, Brokat, or Menoriskat. And this is what the Drokpa, who wander into Bhutan, speak. I mean, they speak some Nepali and some Tibetan and some Chinese, but the majority of their language is this language that predates Sanskrit by three, three, four thousand years. And so this is the language I think was on the disc. So one of the things that the researchers say is that Chipute is not a Chinese name. Well, gosh dang it, it isn't. <laughs> However, it sounds an awful lot like Shifu Te. And so Shifu is a title. It means teacher or master. And so here you have a teacher of, of archaeology exploring caves. He would have been called Shifu Te. And when you look up Te online or in, in general, what you will discover is it says this is a Western transliteration of Tanchu, a popular Chinese name. So right there in the basic five inches of research, you realize that Shifu Te or Chifu Te is not a Chinese name. It's more of a title, and the title of the surname has been transliterated. And so if you apply this lens then to Sungu Nui, you come up with Suang Nguyen, which is a Hao Chinese name, which is Vietnamese Chinese. And so this, this person very much could be a, a real person. The Dropa becomes the Dro Zopa, Drokpa, and Brokpa. So there's that. The Ham Chinese become the Kham Tibetan. So there's that. And so then the only thing that was left over between you know these two stories is Sun Gods in Exile, being a potential hoax, or the fact that the Beijing Academy of Sciences and prehistory doesn't exist. Well, if you're looking for it today, you're never going to find it. Because in 1949, it was reestablished as the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. And one of the departments there is prehistory. And so it's the same place. And so all, all of, you know, all of the skepticism is laid, you know, laid by the wayside, because with a little bit more research, you would have discovered more of this, which then gets into the sun gods and exile story. And some of the, some of the things that go on in there, there's, there's a description of the main character, Dr. Carl Robin Evans, who they, the, the researchers call him Carol Evans, even though he has a very Germanic spelling of his name, it's, it's Carl Evans. And he, he's fascinated by what he learns about the Dropa. 
and sets off to go find them in Tibet. And while he's crossing the high altitude passes, he comes across a porter, a little short guy, carrying what he claims to be five to six times his weight, who blows by him on the trail and leaves him winded, basically. And he's trying to keep keep up with this guy. And the skeptics will say, oh, this is impossible. No human being could possibly do that in high altitudes and so on and so forth. Well, enter exhibit A, you know, the Tibetans and Nepalese Sherpas who will carry refrigerators full of Coca-Cola and beer, wearing flip-flops and chain smoking and passing tourists on the trail to go to the villages. And, you know, a refrigerator full of beer weighs five, 600 pounds. And, you know, here's this 130 pound guy built like an ox carrying this on his back and flip-flops up muddy trails and across bamboo bridges. I mean, of course, but if you hadn't been immersed in that culture in the 1960s, 1970s, or even 1930s, when those stories supposedly, or 40s, when the story is supposedly written about, you would never know this. And so then he comes across a naked monk meditating in the high altitude passes on the glacier, totally naked. He's been sitting there for hours, and Evans is just staring at him going, how is this man not freezing to death? He's completely naked. I'm freezing to death. I'm wearing you know wool and bundled up for the North Pole, and here's this guy meditating like it's nobody's business. And so skeptics will also say, oh, this is an impossible feat for human beings. Well, enter exhibit B, Wim Hof, the Iceman, you know, <laughs> who's mastered what the Tibetans call the inner fire. And we learn about this on Captain Cook's voyages when he goes down around the southern coast of Australia and ends up in Tasmania. Well, Tasmania is in subarctic climate. And here you have the Tasmanians who are naked, running around. They don't have fire, and they're all cannibals. And Captain Cook's all bundled up for the, you know, the South Pole, pretty much. How are these people able, you know, to survive naked on a, you know, sub sub Arctic uh, environment? So anyway, this 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 is where the story just kept unfolding and unfolding and unfolding. And so that's that's kind of the the basic background of the Dropa and and my research into them. What do you think they are? What do you think they are? The Dropa people, the culture, like the, this folklore. Do you think it was? I mean, it certainly seems like there was a group of people that were traveling through these areas and got given a slightly different variation of their names and obviously made enough of an impact to be written about. But what do you think that they really were? In today's world, they would be a hybrid um, of the original Dropa people and, and humanity. And in one of the stories, there's a depiction of the warriors having their way with the women of Earth. Oh, this story seems to pop up in a lot of UFO. Yeah. <laughs> history. And so when they returned to Sirius, the scientists realized that humanity here on Earth has a similar genetic marker to themselves and therefore could be genetic cousins. And realized that if they're fornicating with the humans, there could be a human hybrid race of Dropa here. And they returned to Earth, and this is when they crash land. And I believe that the search parties that went out to find food, water, and shelter were the people that were buried in the caves by the local tribes. Um, the to me, it's discs with the, with the discs. Correct. And so in Chinese culture, a lot of royal and mystic and um, upper, upper caste, upper class burials are buried with by discs. And people don't really know what these things are. A lot of them are smooth and they don't have any writing on them. Some of them like this one has writing on it. And so they're enigmatic. People do not know what their function is. Um, a lot of them have spells or family history written on them if, if they do have writing on them or prayers or, or this, that, and the other. And in some burials, they've found hundreds of them. Wow. However, we're talking 1938 here, and a lot of this information in Western culture isn't, isn't available. And again, this group of nomadic people that comes out of this region of Tibet their history dovetails with a lot of Buddhist cultural mysticism talking about the planet of Sirius. And so, or planetary systems around Sirius, in a sense, because Sirius is a star. And so, to me, you know, I started piecing it together and, and going, huh. And one of the ascended Toku masters, which comes out of this story um, called the Lotus Sutra, which is a, it's a thick tome of, of Buddhist poetry, basically talks about this character named Gadgad Savara. And Gadgad Savara is from Sirius. And what's interesting about Gadgad Savara is he comes to Manjusuri, who's the disciple of Sakyamuni, the Buddha at the time, in, in deep meditation. And he leaves 
Mandasuri a gift of seven jeweled lotus flowers. And Mandasuri comes out of his meditation and he goes to Sakyamuni and he asks, who is God God Savara and how is he able to, to meet me in the astral plane of my meditation? To which uh, Sakyamuni says, God God Savara is a sage or a bodhisattva from the brightest star that rises in the east. This is all in, in poetic verse. And so the brightest star that rises in the east is Sirius, right? <laughs> and so here we have this being that comes from Sirius, and he's mastered the ancient meditational spiritual technology of astral projection, which is how he's able to find you in the astral plane while you're meditating. And so Mandasuri then asks him, hey, how can I learn this technique to meet God God Savara in the astral plane myself? And Sakyamuni says, as you're not initiated, you would have to be guided into this practice to go into deep states of meditation to astral project. And so he is guided by another bodhisattva of, of Sakyamuni, he's another disciple. And in the astral plane, he meets with God God Savara. And he asks God God Savara, can you come visit Earth in physical form? And God God Savara takes the challenge and he says, yes. And he is described in this chapter 23 of the Lotus Sutra, described as climbing atop his tall flying palace, a tower of seven layers. Okay, so here's kind of an interesting reference to Mount Meru as well, the seven oh, layers. The, the Vimana. And the flying Vimana. Yeah. And accompanied by the sounds of hundreds of thousands of musical instruments, he crosses the dimensions of time and space and arrives at Earth. He comes down from the clouds. He descends his tall tower or his flying palace, and he meets with Manjusuri, Sakyamuni, and all of their disciples. He's described as having the golden body or golden yellow skin and eyes bluer than the bluest of, of um, jeweled jades, basically, or jeweled lotus flowers. So here is this description of Adropa, <laughs> quite literally. And he blesses Earth. He calls Earth this beautiful place, unlike the Saha, where he comes from, this world around the brightest star that rises in the east, which he claims was destroyed by warfare and left as mud, filth, rocks, and mountains. So another repeat of the story. Complete repeat of this of this story of the Dropa. Now, the Lotus Sutra would not have been known to hardly anybody, if anybody, in the 1930s and 40s, because people were not researching this stuff back then nor in the 1970s, because you would, you know, you would have to have gained access into Tibet or Bhutan to start learning or reading more about this. And these two countries were next to impossible to get into during this time period. So then Gungad Savara climbs back atop his tall palace and accompanied again by the sounds of hundreds of thousands of musical instruments, he departs, crossing the dimensions of time and space back to his realm of Sirius. And so what, what are they talking about here? You know, this is an extraterrestrial craft that's misunderstood technology. And the cacophony of noise, you know, is its repulsor lifts as it comes into the atmosphere. I mean, what else is what else are the sounds of hundreds of thousands of musical instruments, but you know, a big blare of, you know, of, of sound that that is poetic in, in this in this verse. And then the description of this guy, he comes from, you know, he's he's described as an extraterrestrial. And so here we have this direct connection with Sirius and, you know, Buddhist culture, like 100 fold, which dovetails into the story of the Drupa who have come here, you know, before or possibly multiple times. Are you familiar with the Dogon tribe? Yes. Out of Mali, Africa. Yeah. Right. And they have a similar story. Robert, Robert, Robert Temple put that together with another anthropologist. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's correct. And it's, you know, it's a similar story, a kind of arc type vehicle descends to the ground and there's all this wind and and sound coming from it and then these amphibious beings known as the nomo i think it was the nomo yeah the nomo yeah correct um who gave the dogon tribe information about sirius b so i i mean it fascinates me to kind of just contemplate what the actual importance of that star system is to our planet well, even in the myths of Atlantis, okay, yeah. I, yeah. I believe Atlantis was a period of time, not just a place, and it was a period of time where, like today, we could we could be in complete repeat. We had a global civilization, and the overlords or the the hierarchy of Atlantis are all said to have come from Sirius, 
And so in the original Dropa storyline, if they were to come here 12,000 years ago in their winged gliders, were they actually fleeing the Great Cataclysm? Because this is the same period of time as the Halocene Comet Impact event, right. which caused Meltwater Pulse B, according to Graham Hancock, which literally flooded the world 500 feet of water in a matter of minutes. And so cities like Dwaraka off the coast of India were submerged underwater 10,000 years ago. And Dwaraka is the size of Manhattan, and it sits you know, 100 kilometers off the coast of, of, of India. And nobody would have known it was there until the Boxing Day tsunami. And all of a sudden, they're discovering these vast cities. And so the question, you know, is were the Dropo fleeing, you know, fleeing that, or had they come through the dimensional portal of Mount Meru and through Shambhala and had come come to Earth this way? And so there's there's a couple of, of overlaps. But how many different cultures talk about beings from Sirius? It's like yeah. it's it's ingrained in almost every cultural religion. It's Again, I mean, like, you know, th this is what for me validates these things and deserves further research and, and scrutiny because, um, you know, most typically skeptical people would just be like, okay, yeah, stories about flying castles and magical mountains and rainbows and portals and dimensions. That's all great. That's all brilliant, lovely folklore. But the, yeah, when, when you actually have something tangible, like, okay, explain to me how all of these different cultures started learning about the Sirius star system. Like, why exactly is that? cropping up in all of these different cultures they're building monuments that align with them or they're referencing them in their texts and so it's it's something tangible that brings the folklore into something that could just be more of our long forgotten history than just fairy tales you know uh, i was talking with jay widener about this as well and you know there there is a there is a buzz around you know the astrophysics and science community that we are part of the serious star system Hmm. And it's only eight, it's only eight light years away, right? And so we know it's a binary system. Most of the systems that we find planetary uh, planets around basically are binary, but there's a thought that Sirius is actually a trinary system. And what's fascinating about the Nomo coming back to them is that these the Nomo taught you know this this Dogon tribe in Africa about the rotational period of Sirius A and B which is part of their like fertility dance ritual and, and their, their ritual for the harvest. And, you know, speaking of other, you know, you, you get into Egyptian culture and you have Isis and Osiris and Horus, and they supposedly came from Sirius as well as did Tehut or, or Thoth. Right. And these are characters that come directly out of the Atlantis story. If you're looking into uh, some of the work that Steiner had done with with uh, channeling a lot of what he had learned about Atlantis, he's talking about these characters as well. And then you even get into Islam, and so in Mecca is is the Kaaba building, this black cube, which is Saturnian symbolism. And you go around it seven times counterclockwise during the Hajj, which usually happens around this time of year. It's like the end of July, early August, and it's when Sirius and Canis Major rise above the horizon. And in the eastern corner of this Kaaba building, in the eastern corner facing east where Sirius would rise, is what is known as the Kaaba stone. And the Kaaba stone is a piece of meteorite, supposedly from Sirius, which is also thought to be part of the Sintamani stone. Right, right. And it sits in the middle of a silver yoni. And so here you have Sirius symbolism, you have the goddess symbolism, and you have Saturnian symbolism, all in the heart of of Islam in the most sacred city that they that they go for um, pilgrimage every year. And at some point in your life, as as a Muslim, you make it there and you kiss the Kaaba stone. Yeah, <laughs> which is interesting because Oculus and and Meta have created a fake Kaaba stone yeah. that you can put your Oculus on and you can go touch the yoni and touch the stone. And it's as if you're right there at Mecca, but you're not. <laughs> it's like this to me just speaks of something a lot deeper than what a lot of people recognize. And they just look at it as, oh, it's ritual, it's tradition. But the deeper you dig into it, especially as you're going to get into the origins of, of where the, these inspirations came from, you start seeing the patterns of, of something that actually might have happened in our history. And I find uh, it interesting that uh, one of the four gifts, the, the the Sintamani stone, is a piece of glass that they think might have come from a meteorite. Because 
if that's uh, if that's true, it might draw a correlation to some of the research being done by a friend of mine called Bruce Fenton. I don't know if you've heard of Bruce yeah. Fenton before. I have not. No. Uh, he's a great guy. He's been on History Channel a few times, and he's put together a pretty well considered proposal for a, a major event in our past. Now I can't remember the the date that he was giving for this, but he would obviously be able to give it. Uh, and I did an interview with him not that long ago. Uh, a, a major event in our past involving an artificial probe or a structure that rained debris onto the planet, which is made evident with his proposal due to the existence of a debris field, and it's a massive debris field or a series of debris fields made from uh, a meteoric glass called Australite Tektite. Have you heard of that? Really? Yes. Right. So there was this huge debris field strewn like 12,000 kilometers across the world from China to Antarctica, all made up of this Australite tektite, which he proposed. And he's, he could he could certainly explain it better than me because he gives a pretty good reason for why he believes this might have been some form of artificial probe or structure that blew up or in some way was disintegrating around the orbit of the planet and was strewing this huge debris field across it. But this is meteorite glass. This is meteoric glass. So it's it's just a an interesting correlation. And I wonder if perhaps the fourth gift was uh, was one of these Australite tektite samples. Interesting. Uh, d- does this dovetail at all with any of Avi Loeb's uh, recent work, where he's he's like combing the the, the floor of the ocean, looking for these mi- micro granules as well? Yeah, and he thinks came so- from an exploded craft. I don't know if he's going down the exact same route as Bruce with the Australite tektites, but he's certainly doing something similar of trying to find these kind of, uh, you know, mo- uh, small, small fragments of something that had gone into the ocean. And I know they're out there trying to find that and discover that. I think they've actually written a paper recently about what's covered. Yeah, I haven't read the paper yet, but it could be a similar type of thing. It just makes me wonder, you know, there's a lot of reference to meteorite glass and even in Egypt, I believe Tutankhamun's dagger. Yeah. uh, Metal from a meteorite. Yeah. It's, it's actually glass, but when you go out, yeah. yeah, When you, when you go out into the far uh, Eastern desert or Western desert, basically um, this stuff is like all over the desert because something either exploded in the air above the desert and created all this, uh, right meter in a glass or you know crashed into the desert and that's that's fascinating that uh what, what you're talking about with with this research because if you look at the indian ocean and you look at like the maldives and mauritius and then the northwestern coast of australia it's very obvious that something hit the indian ocean right. and caused this massive tidal effect because you can see the waving effect on the landmass and so some something you know i mean we're we're obviously we're not immune to you know what goes on in the galaxy and if if we're being tethered around our sun as it's being tethered around the galaxy we're going to go through different patches of turbulence as we were talking on the plane exactly. that 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 could that could cause um you know instability on earth we we don't really see what's in front of our sun because we're looking at our sun as if we're on a record player going around it. Right. But in reality, our sun is like a giant comet moving through space. And we are being tethered with it this way as it moves forward. So we don't actually see what's in front of our sun. And this kind of gets into the idea around could there be genetic cousins out there? Mm. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of the phantom DNA um, studies that have been done at all <laughs> phantom dna sounds familiar but i don't know enough so maybe remind me and the people listening. so there were there there were three studies uh done one of them was done with a green laser and so they took a test tube full of seawater right and a test tube where the water had been completely autoclaved so it was completely sterile and they put it in a, a isolation chamber for 18 hours and they shined the green laser beam which is plasma energy keep that in mind through the seawater test tube, and if you've ever looked at seawater test tube, it's full of micro plants and animals and, and crustacean and shellfish into the autoclaved sterile test tube. And they came back 18 hours later, and both test tubes had the same life in it growing. Wow. 
So this beggars the question, if we're going through space, tumbling through space and going through different regions, and we know the bacteria is in space because of the Hayabusa probe that went out there with its, with its plate and brought back bacteria that had collected in space. And as Carl Sagan said, if we even find a micron of bacteria in space, then the universe is teeming with life. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and then you have trajected pansformia as well. And so if you're going through these pockets of space that are full of bacteria and DNA, and you have a water bearing planet like the test tube. Okay. And a plasma generator like our sun, <laughs> And it's beaming its rays through all this DNA and bacteria into the water of the planet, you're going to have life. And this is why we have these different explosions of life throughout history where people are like, how did the Cambrian explosion happen? We don't even know. All of a sudden you have this whole new series of life on the planet. And so this is this is kind of, you know, a little bit of my take on the phantom DNA effect using right. our, our stellar friend here in the sky that we don't really study, and we should be, because <laughs> when I was a kid, the sun was yellow and Nowadays, it's very white, and so it's it's yeah. definitely going through a transformation, or it could be going through a different you know energy density of space, basically. Well, I mean, a lot of the people who loosely say we're going through an awakening process, which to be fair, I do believe we are, I just don't know what kind of process of awakening that is. <laughs> we can just refer to that as evolution, but you know, a lot of people in those types of communities would say that we're moving into another density of time and space. Right. I mean, correct. Them, they could be absolutely right. If we're traversing through the universe and we're not just going around the little circle of space that we're keeping ourselves locked into, but we're moving through space as the sun travels, then it's fairly reasonable to imagine that we could enter into a very novel terrain that we haven't experienced yet that could have different effects. Very much so. And and often, you know, there there is a specific date or year associated with this. And it's usually this thirty six thousand year, you know, marker for some right. reason. A quarter turn around, but it's it's the drift through the astral plane, basically. It's <laughs> it's one of those. And this is you know, where the ancients came up with the Kali Yuga, you know, and, and all the different Yuga cycles and right. How how the esoteric knowledge gets into, you know, we've gone through the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Metal Age to the, you know, all these different ages of, of humanity. But this is very reminiscent of these densities and very reminiscent of, you know, some of this ancient, you know, spirit, spiritual technology or, or, or mindset. Well, a group of people that were very interested in the ancient spiritual technologies and esoteric uh, artifacts and knowledge who were also it would seem by proxy interested in the UFO subject were the Nazis. And the Nazis were known to go through Tibet and Nepal and were looking to try and unearth all of these interesting ideas and artifacts and potential powers. I believe that's where the whole real energy um, came from in the formation. The ether, of, yeah. The ether, right. formation of like the Ananurba German group and the real uh, society. And it's interesting that you have this bleed over effect again with ancient knowledge and esotericism, and then also the UFO subject, because there are people who truly do think that the Nazis were working on some very novel propulsion systems that were trying to mirror these flying saucers, and that there was a whole lot of kind of tug of war after the fall of Berlin when we tried to get this technology through paperclip and obviously brought these Nazis over to create NASA with Werner von Braun and all of this. So what what do you think about the the Nazi Germany connection with ufology and also with specifically Tibet and Nepal and the uh, the kind of uh, esoteric traditions and artifacts and potential powers that were lurking in these cultures that they wanted to get hold of powers and technology like the Sintamani stone for for instance even though it's not a technology but it is something that's been revered forever since its knowledge and its existence mystics and empires have sought after it forever. And so a lot of the, what the Adenerbe were going through these areas looking for ancient tech, either Vimana technology that they had learned about through the Mahabharata and other fantastical stories coming out of the Vedas, um, Tibetan technology, you know, the, these mysteries of levitation, yeah. deep radiation, sound, this and resonance and sound. And this gets into some of, you know, the ascended Tolkien masters I was talking about as well. And so some of these stories could have come around as well. Um, 
you have this nomadic group of people that have influenced, you know, Buddhism across the region, the, the Dropa Dropa connection. But they even made their way up into the Black Sea and influenced the Taltosh in in Romania. Wow. And and Hungarian like shamans very similarly. And it's fascinating that the first three phase rocket came out of nineteen fifty or fifteen fifty five out of Romania. And it was the first three-phase rocket that was ever launched into the air. Was somebody on it? We don't know. But okay. yeah, you, you can look, look this up. Long before Germany was building any of their rockets. Like 1555 rocket, yeah. And so it's it's this knowledge filtration and knowledge uh, creep you know, that, that seems to be affecting people. Um, a lot of, I think, what the Germans were working on came out of what the Prussians had been working on. I don't know if you familiarized yourself with Walter Bosley's work. Uh, he not talks a lot. Only, yeah, not entirely. You, you should get into some of what he talks about with yeah. the airship mysteries, because a lot of what's going on with the airship mysteries is very similar to stuff that like Victor Schauberger and you know, Nikolai Tesla were, and even Tetons of Brown and uh, Alexander Heaviside. These guys were all experimenting with, you know, um, pulsing electricity and, and plasma electricity that could could bring on a levitation or or a flight, an anti-gravitic flight of sorts. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's technology. Does that tie into uh, Walter Bosley? Does that tie into the uh, was it the Sonora Aero Club? Correct. Yes. So that's that's part of what he's got a bunch of books. One of them is called Origin, and then there's a couple of other ones that he he writes about this story. And but a lot of the stuff that he's talking about in that you know could be then translated through the Varel Society you know, t to try and create these alternative wonder weapons, which they were trying to do in Germany, you know, like the, the bell, what was the bell? I mean, anybody that got near it would die because it was kicking off so much radiation because they were just pulsing it with so much electricity. But what were they trying to, what were they trying to invent or create, you know, heavy lift, you know, anagravitics. Um, you get into some of the stuff that TT Brown was doing and, you know, stealth technology today. And, he realized that if you can pulse enough electricity through copper, you can get lift. And so I was at a convention with Nassim Haramein, and these people had brought out their own, you know, technology. It was all, you know, TT Brown technology, basically. And it was like these hexagonal scaffoldings that were made out of porcelain or something that's non um non current conducting. And then they were cross woven wrapped with five mil copper wiring. And at the end was a little piece that you could plug onto a nine volt battery and you you tie this thing around the nine volt battery and this scaffolding and copper wiring would lift off the table and float and create, you know, that bright white light that has every other light encompassed in it, you know, Octaria and the color magic and until the battery wore out and then it would just crash back down on the table. And so the stealth bomber kind of does this with its wing. And so it will ionize yeah. the tip of its wing. And it basically can can fold, you know, time and space to a small fraction and create ether around it, and and have somewhat of a zero zero gravity um, technology. And then you even look at at this um, at the SR seventy one Blackbird and and the A ten or the A one ten prior to that, which had a drone or a parasitic aircraft that could sit on the back of it that could carry up to three astronauts, satellites, or other equipment. And this technology came out in the 1950s. Okay. That was when the SR-71 was commissioned. We didn't learn about it until 1985 when they retired it, but it was invented in the 1950s. And it can leave our atmosphere and go into outer space. I mean, we kind of see this alluded to in the X-Men movies, right? But yeah. here, we have, here we have an airplane that can carry a crew or a manifest of, of equipment into space what the hell do we need the Saturn three rocket for? <laughs> we have a we have an aircraft fifteen years before it that can do this. Yeah, and and so, uh, yeah, just fascinating to me that, the, you know, there's a very public program about space, and then there's a very private program about space. And the real question is how how far back does the private program go? Have we recovered you know ancient technology and ancient equipment? You know, this is kind of the question I'd love to ask Grosh, you know, what, what his knowledge is about this. Are are these crash retrievals recent or are they ancient? Mm. Because when we went into Afghanistan, they were talking about, you know, SEAL Team 6 came across, you know, in a cave in Afghanistan, an ancient Vimana. 
And then that story was hushed up real quick and misdirection went here and there and a whole bunch of other stories. And you got to wonder, you know, why is everybody, what is this huge fascination continuously of Afghanistan? Well, yeah, it's incredibly rich in minerals, but there's nothing really there or is there? <laughs> well, these are, these are, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, you know, th these are the cradles of humanity. This is where so right. much civilization flourished and so much ancient history is embedded in these regions. And obviously, because of the state of the regions, doing any sort of large scale archaeology is extremely difficult. And so that history is, uh, is, you know, covered up. And obviously, you'd probably have private teams that have the rights and the clearances to go out there and do that kind of archaeology. But it's, 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 blocked away from the wider scientific community and then yeah you know talking about um you know this sequestering of technology and, and the hiding of technology it's it's funny that you mentioned x-men because as we were talking about anna nerba in germany i just couldn't help but think of indiana jones and we just we don't realize that within our western media there's just these little elements of truth that are mixed into our entertainment so indiana jones a crazy story about this guy that's going around killing germans yeah but he was in oss which was real and they went out on nazis which were legitimately going to these countries looking for artifacts and were obsessed with the occult and so you have this like you know, dramatized version of something that was very real, very real, very real. Yes, uh, X Men with the you know the the spy the spy platforms and their capabilities, just kind of like flexing a little bit through entertainment. And uh, I, I wonder as well whether or not some of these recoveries, if there have been any, were archaeological in in nature. And I would imagine that they probably would be. And if they are. That ties in a whole other element of the rabbit hole. Let's bring in the Smithsonian and let's say that they have got these special access programs. You know, it's not just government and Boeing right. and Lockheed Martin and contractors and defense. But who funds the Smithsonian? It is it is government. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. But it's all these different arms. It's all these different arms, and not everyone uh, would appreciate or understand that something like the Smithsonian might be involved in a cover up. The Vatican as well involved in historical sequestering of information i mean we know about the vast archives that you can't access unless you're a very specific scholar in a specific discipline then you can get your you have to know exactly what you're looking for yep, so ex it's exactly like a compartment and special access program within the government. Go. you have to know yes. exactly what you want you get your need to know and you don't get anything outside of your need to know so there is vast, vast, uh, you know, swathes of, of information that are just completely cut off to the, to the majority of humanity. And so when you stumble across these little threads like the Dropa and the Dropa Stones, and you stumble across these threads through India and through China and through Egypt and through the Middle East, you start to see a picture coming together that suggests that, hey, look, maybe there was some interaction, maybe there was some influence from something else. And maybe there's something else came from here or it came from Sirius but either way there is an interaction and we're seeing this now in the modern discussion with UAP from 2017 up to present day we're having this new discussion about UFOs and UAP but it's all very ambiguous we haven't got a definitive it's now unidentified anomalous phenomena so it's very amorphous and I think that there are much more refined definitions and much more refined pieces of evidence and intelligence that are being held by certain groups would you agree with that? I would totally, and that's that's interesting that they keep changing the vernacular from UFO to UAP. To, and this this to me seems like knowledge capture. You know, they they want to control the narrative to some degree. Um, a lot of what's been released recently in in you know in Congress is not unlike what Stephen you know, Greer was doing with the Disclosure Project. It's not unlike you know what people were talking about in the seventies. I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap with this, but now it's just like one group or another has has done this knowledge capture, and it's like, oh, well, it's now our turn to play with this. In 2019, the number one search on Google was UFOs. Yeah. And so wouldn't you want to profit off of that? Wouldn't you want to cause a stir, especially if you're a government organization? Why would you want to do that? Well, we need more funding. We need to weaponize space, or you know, we need more military funding. So if we can consider this a threat or a threat narrative, then we get into this really interesting aspect of, well, now that we have this ambiguous threat out there, we need more funding for it. You know, what is Space Force all about? What did you know? Yeah, what they just, they just threw Space Force a whole bunch of billions. I think it was the highest amount they'd, they'd got since its inception. Point, point taken. And so, you know, the question is, if they can continually create a stir, it, it puts government agencies in the control seat of the narrative and they control the story. 
And so you look at all these whistleblowers like Lou Elizondo and Grosh, and they're all, you know, they're all groomed. They're all part of, you know, especially with Lou Elizondo, he was part of a disinformation campaign for the CIA. And if you know anything about, you know, these three letter agencies, you don't ever leave them. You, you never retire from them. They're always a part of your reality because you are in a seat where you are asked to keep secrets or, 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 or divert or misdirect. And as, as we were saying earlier, there's a lot of misdirection around the UFO stories. Some of it is real. Some of it isn't, as we know, they kind of have to tell us what they're doing so that we, as you know, mass populace go along with it. A lot of that comes through movies. A lot of this drip, 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 you know, of technology and drip, drip, drip of disclosure comes in the form of entertainment Yeah, because we're so distracted by all the things going on in our lives, you know, why, why would I pay attention to this unless it's a direct threat to me? And this is kind of where this threat narrative comes back around. And now they're, they're pushing this card. You were talking Werner von Braun. So when Werner von Braun left NASA, he released a lot of information that he probably shouldn't have. He went and worked for a company called Fairchild Industries, which is a semiconductor company. And his secretary actually lives here in Oregon, where I live. She lives out in Florence, uh, I believe. And her name's Carol Rosin. And he approached her and he gave her the ultimatum. He said, look, they're going to start doing things that you're going to start seeing in the society to condition us toward something that's going to happen in the future. First, they'll roll out terrorists. Oh, God, we have this huge scare with terrorists, you know, the Taliban and, you know, the Mujahideen and then that became Al Qaeda and ISIS and all these different groups. Then you'll have rogue nations. Okay, so you have rogue nations like Libya, like Iraq, like Iran, like Syria. Okay, other rogue nations. What's going on right now in, in, you know, the the Baltic countries and so on and so forth. You have all these rogue nations that that come out of this play. Okay, then you will have environmental threat. Oh, God, climate change. Here we are, you know, ramp up the fear, more, more fear. And then... We will have threats from space, like asteroids. The asteroid narrative has come back around. You know, we're we're going through the torrid uh, meteor stream. We can get pummeled again, like we have in the past. And then the final card that they're going to roll out, Carol. The final card is the UFO card. And he says all of it is fake. It's all so that they can gain control and access the money. And it's like, huh, that's interesting because in my belief, I believe part of it is very real, <laughs> but. The narrative to get there, to co coerce humanity into this, you know, one one world existence is interesting. Look at what Ronald Reagan talked about on the floor of the UN. He said, you know, I often wonder, paraphrasing horribly here, I often wonder if we had some sort of extraterrestrial visitation on this planet, how quickly we would forget all of our own problems and unite as a world. And to me, that's always been fascinating because that totally falls into what Bernard von Braun was talking about. It totally falls into what a lot of the esoteric, you know, traditions are are aiming toward is kind of this, you know, utopian paradise. Look at Gene Roddenberry in Star Trek, how his future looked, you know, we, we, we've abandoned money, poverty and, and sickness. Why? So we can embedder humanity <laughs> and, and live amongst the stars. And it's like, okay, I think at some point that's, that's a direction that we need to go in. We need to be in the middle of these crazy wars and all of a sudden have this real or fake intervention that unites us all and we get rid of our petty you know aspects and we realize shit we can go into space and you know we can we can do what we need to do and have first contact in a in a, in a real way yeah but you know i'm not willing oh. not willing to trust the false flaggers and government corrupt bureaucratic uh, war machines to outline the destiny of humanity I- it's fake I fully agree with I fully agree with you on that. That's, it's a great idea, but I don't know if Lockheed's really got that type of utopian bend to it, you know? <laughs> no, not at all. And so, you know, that that obviously com- comes back around to what is really going on. What is the reality? Right, right, right. Why is there a knowledge capture? Why is there, you know, a coercion of the narrative? What 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 is what is the purpose and what is the what is the outcome of this? And so Finding some of these ancient stories makes it even more fascinating because that's not knowledge capture. Right. That's something that was, you know, historically recorded in in memory or through story. And so at, at some point in time, we gotta ask 
the real honest question, are we the aliens here? <laughs> are we the extraterrestrials? I mean, look at what we do to this planet. Sure. We, we, we tear down nature to rebuild it in our, yeah. in our own. We clothe ourselves. What other animal clothes themselves? You know, we have poor vision, you know, poor posture. Our, our relation to gravity on this planet is, is not the relation that other animals have. Most all other animals on this planet have night vision. We do not. You know, we have 180 sound. Most animals don't. They have directional sound, you know. Um, we we have a circadian rhythm that's like 26 and a half hours, not 24. And so, I mean, everything about our existence here seems like we are the intruders. Slightly off. Slightly off. We are, we are the ones that possibly don't belong here, yeah. which then asks the question even more. How did we get here? Why are we still here? Is our destiny here or amongst... The, amongst the sky is are we in quarantine or you know on a prison planet in a sense and you know all this comes up in a lot of really amazing uh peer-reviewed literature itself you know even ancient script it's like we we have been visited or we are the visitors and so this is this is an interesting question it is an interesting question and i i, I kind of get the sense that maybe we're would would you uh, a few ontological shocks and and <laughs> This information will start coming out in our lifetime. I, I, I get. I would hope. I would hope so. Yeah. I, I get the sense that it will. Like just intuitively, I just have a real sense that there is there is quite revelatory information kind of coming down the pipeline. If not through any sort of government disclosure, just through a natural process of evolution with humanity, we're going to discover things. We're going to find out more about our reality and about our history and potentially about our future. We're on the verge of an AI quantum computer singularity. You know, we're in a very weird space in the landscape of our evolutionary journey. If you look back towards all of the times before then, and each generation obviously believes it's on the precipice of revolution and change. Right. <laughs> That's true. But we really are at a pretty substantial leap now, uh, I think, in terms of the potential capabilities of our species as technology starts to become more intertwined with our own physiology, which a lot of people are resistant to, clearly, and obviously the transhumanism kind of component of evolving into a biomechanical kind of symbiotic machine and creature is not something everyone wants, but it kind of feels like that's the route we might be going down. At least most of humanity is aiming itself on that type of trajectory of integrating with technology, and I wonder if perhaps... Who knows? Maybe that's the precursor to actually understanding some of these big fundamental questions about our own origin story and where we're going in the future is we need a, a higher capacity of being able to comprehend information. And that might come through some form of a, amalgamation with, with technology. Uh, look at what we've done in our own lifetime. I mean, I went to, I went to Intel Developer Forum in 1998. And the key feature there was the Cray supercomputer and, and silicon graphics technology. And Silicon Graphics at that point was one of the first computers doing computer animations for movies. Um, it was probably a fifty to a hundred thousand dollar machine. And the Apple iMac I'm staring at you right now what is probably fifty, sixty times what that machine is, uh, you know, one one fiftieth the cost. Yeah. And probably and, in the this. Oh yeah. Well, so this this is what I'm getting into with, with the Cray supercomputer. So I don't know if you've ever seen a Cray supercomputer, but they're you know the size of a Volkswagen bus, huge, huge, yeah, huge. Yeah. They they use a coolant system, usually a liquid coolant system, and the processing power on it is amazing. Well, this device right here, oh, and they cost forty million dollars, right? This device right here, this this you know our 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 cell phones, basically one iPhone is the consideration of the processing power of two Cray supercomputers. And we're talking 1998 through through today. So in the last you know nearly 30 years we we've, we've gone through the quickening of technology quite literally. Yeah. Yeah. And and it is a quickening and it's getting faster and faster and faster as you said. All the generations before us thought they were on the on the precipice, but there is no end. There's no beginning, right? It just keeps going and going and going. And so we will build up and crash. We will build up and crash over and over and over and over and over again. Exactly. And if, if, if we are living in a simulation or in a machine getting into this strange topic, then perhaps this transhumanist approach is our way of reconnecting with the machine or the, the God, the God type of sorts. 
because what is what is the ultimate achievable? It's like to, to live forever, you know, the, the, and who wants to live forever? God, unless everybody else is living forever. Because if, you know, if you're gifted with that curse, you watch, every, and this is the story of Highlander, you know, in a sense. There could be only one, but you're literally watching everybody that you know and everything that you love die around you while you're not aging. I mean, Wolverine's kind of in the same boat with, yeah. with his healing factor. And so if you look at, you know, Going back to the Sintamani Stone, if you look at that even, what does that grant you? It grants you long life and prosperity. And so is this is this a gift or is it a curse or is it a bit of both? And we were talking about movies. A lot of my background is in symbology and occult symbology. And I like to reference movies all the time because you find a lot of these elements and a lot of these aspects in movies, like astral projection in, I am. in, in Star Wars and you know, the light body also in Star Wars or, you know, there's a lot that comes out of Star Wars, but. Oh, dude, I mean, there's one quote, just real quick, one quote from Yoda, which I've always loved. And I just, I'm not <laughs> a whole thing, but it's where he's going like, luminous beings are we, not this matter. Not this crude like, flesh. You know? Yeah, crude matter. And it's like, damn, you know, isn't that some truth right there? Very you much know? so. I, I've, I've said a few times, I feel like we're Jedi with amnesia. Well, this, this is interesting because you look at a movie like The Last Jedi and everybody hated yeah. that movie. But if you actually look at the esoteric knowledge being shared in that movie, it's mind-blowing. Right. And at, you know, at the end, you have Luke Astro projecting himself halfway across the galaxy from Octo yeah. to Crate, where he confronts Kylo Ren one last time. But he's there in a projection form of himself, and it, it uses up all of his energy. And then the next scene, they show him levitating, staring into the setting twin suns. Mm -hmm. So here you have a Buddhist philosophy, right? That then goes into Kamishan or ancient Egyptian philosophy where they had no concept for death. Their concept for death, they called Westing. And so when you reach the fourth stage of the sun in your physical form, which is Aten, an enlightened form, and you're ready to pass, your spirit will follow the sun over the horizon into Amun or the hidden or darkness, only to be reborn again. This, you know, this is the story of Luke Skywalker, Lucius, Luke, the sun. It walks across the sky until it gets to the horizon, right? Where it meets his dark father, night, darkness, and they battle it out throughout the out of throughout the night, only to be vanquished again in the morning, where Luke rises as the sun that he's supposed to be. Well, I mean, the, the 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 knowledge in movies is mind blowing. Yeah. And getting the Sintamani Stone, if you've ever seen Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four, horrible movie. But what are they talking about? They're talking about the dream stone. Well, this is right. the sent stone. Right. And so Max Lord crushes the dream stone and absorbs all of its power so that he can basically become the wish master of the world, in a sense. And in Buddhism, he would have been called Sintamani Loksavara, the, the one who embodies the power of the Sintamani stone. And so, I mean, all these overlapping, you know, philosophies yeah. through through different cultures is uh, and how they end up in movies is even more mind blowing to me. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's like all just peppered in by the weird cabals that run the world, or if it's just subconscious resonance of things that have happened in our human history that mm. you know someone gets inspired to write something into a story, or like maybe they did a little bit of research and they bring it out, and it just it's it's just kind of this foundational basis of little reminders of things that we've already spoken about many years past and is coming back through modern you know representations i love the skywalker one i didn't know that the way you described the kind of going from night to day and the journey through uh you know encountering darth vader that's very cool i didn't know about that breakdown of the the buddhist interpretation of star wars and the skywalker uh kind of archetype it's i mean it's very much there and i mean you, yeah. you look at the original trilogy so the first movie is all about you know luke becoming the light mm. and the second movie is the horizon where he meets his his past enemy his own father not realizing it's his father but that's you know spoiler alert <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, you're, if you're late to that one it's <laughs> movie, man. and and then and then the, the third movie he's dark he's wearing all black and he's fighting he's battling yeah. his father trying to bring his father back to the light Wow, man. So that that is that is the struggle, you know. He's crossing the he's crossing the sky quite literally, leaving Tatooine. Here's another planet that's that's binary in, in in nature, and then ending ending right back up around. I mean, you even look at Merkaba technology, and so the Merkaba is you know the the tetrahedron spinning 
counterclockwise, creating a vortex inside of it that you know can then shield you as you travel through astral, you know, astral dimensions, basically, in a sense. Well, you have a manifestation of a Merkaba in the movie The Fountain, where Tommy at the end of the movie creates a Merkaba so he can basically take the tree of life, its sacred milk, and the fountain of youth back to Shabalba, which is very similar to Shambhala or <laughs> Or Agartha, and it's it's an underworld for the Mayans. It's it's their you know their their hell or their underworld. But in in the fountain, it's a stellar nursery that sits at the base stars of Orion, which is where a stellar nursery actually is. And so he is taking himself and his energy and himself as the seed and the tree of life and the fountain of youth to be reborn in in the stellar nursery by using this Merkabot protective technology. But then you can also have a very physical nuts and bolts Merkaba. And this comes out of directly out of Empire Strikes Back, where you see Darth Vader in his Merkaba chamber. Right, right. In the like the pot that closes. In the in, in the it's an octahedron and it yeah. opens up and he's got his helmet off. So he's able to heal inside of this yeah. end. So that's where he that's where he sits to get into deep states of mind. Yes. Think about that. He's, he's also he's also able to telekinetically connect with Luke, yeah. the Emperor, and other Jedi and Sith practitioners. <laughs> And so here we have physical Merkaba technology, right? And so it's 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 all right there for people to see. I mean, astral projection. Look at look at Doctor Strange, where the you know here's this Buddhist character of the ancient one, brilliant movie, pushes him out of his own body, and in the blink of an eye, shows him the horrors and the beauties of the multiverse and the dimensions of time and space, mm-hmm. and then breaks him right back into his into his present form. That's as this is astral projection. And he's not initiate, so he doesn't know how to go there himself. <laughs> he hasn't learned or mastered the meditational spiritual technology of astral projection. He has to be guided through it. I mean, it's it's so right there in your face. But you're so dazzled by the visuals and the rest yeah. of the story that you're not you're not paying attention to any of that. And that's no. no. It's trippy, man. Like it's trippy and it it does speak to something that I think like we were saying earlier that we've lost, this ancient spiritual technology that technology of resonance of frequency of getting yourself into a state of intuitive belief and ritualistic practices and repetition and breaking the algorithm in in a, in a certain sense hacking the algorithm of space and time itself if we looked at it in the same concept as a simulation then perhaps as conscious observers and experiences and traverses of this simulation we're able to manipulate it bend it maybe even break it in certain ways and so this uh, this knowledge is is embedded in our cultures. It's embedded to the point where it's even echoed in Western uh, Hollywood movies. So you know it's it's important. And I, I like the ones you've highlighted because I didn't know about the uh, certain elements of that. That's interesting. It's given me a uh, given me the desire to kind of look back on Star Wars and and give it another another view through the esoteric lens. But hey, dude, look, um, where can people get hold of your book and? Is there any way in which people can get hold of you online, social media, that kind of stuff? So I have a site that basically deals with a lot of my travels to Peru and Egypt and all over the world. It's obviously still always a work in progress. It has a lot of my other interviews with uh, Johnny Enoch. Mm -hmm. I did a couple on Symbology. I did two interviews on the Dropa and also with Jay Widener. And then I just did an interview about world travels and whatnot with Brad Olson. Uh, this can all be found on a site called Mega Mist, M-E-G-A-M-Y-S-T, which stands for Megalithic Mysteries. Uh, my book is also linked there, but I'm self-publishing it through Lulu Press. And so it will direct you to Lulu to, to purchase it. It's, I believe it's 22 US dollars for the purchase. And then um, starting to get more of my social media up and running. I'm going to be at an event uh, between September 14th and 17th in Las Vegas called Alien Event, where I'm speaking about pretty much a lot of these topics and the subjects within my book, a little bit about my history growing up, some of the things I'm interested in. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the, the best way to get a hold of me is through Mega Mist. And uh, every, everything is linked up there. There's a lot of smaller blog posts about some of the esoteric knowledge found in movies. I've done some other reviews of other movies that might, might be mind-blowing to some people. Just you know, seeing ancient art and then seeing how it re- re- repeats in movies and, and right. whatnot—it's just like, wow, this is kind of mind blowing. But yeah, that's that's pretty much where you can get a hold of me through, through megamist.com. Awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, come see me at Alien Event. 
<laughs> but yeah, if, you, if you're out in Vegas or if you can get to Vegas, go and check out Hans there. And also links will be in the description box below for the website and for the book. So I definitely recommend checking it out. And uh, I just want to say thank you, man. Like, hey, look, we had a great time in California. We had a great time in L.A. It was really fun sitting on the flight with you. You made me feel better about the fact that we were rocketing through the air and I was starting to get a little freaked out. So I appreciate that. But no, dude, it's been a real pleasure having you on, man. And uh, hopefully in the future, you know, you put out more work, you come back on, we'll have another catch up. I appreciate that. And I really appreciate your time today, Jay. This has been awesome.